Hello and welcome to part one of this series of short videos expanding on the core low intensity CBT interventions that PWPs use with their patients. My name is Josh Cable and over the last seven years I've worked in a variety of roles within IAPT including PWP, Supervisor PWP, Step 2 Lead and more recently as a lecturer on PWP training programmes at a number of high profile UK universities. I created these videos as tools to support PWP's understanding of the core step two interventions. This is not intended to replace your university training, but supplement your understanding in an easy to digest format. Today, we're focused on behavior activation, a CBT based treatment for depression. In a nutshell, what behavior activation claims is that by increasing the amount of positive experience in our lives, for example, enjoyment and achievement, we can improve our mood. The first step of any treatment intervention should be psychoeducation. What you're doing here is supporting the patient to understand the symptoms they're currently experiencing. I think that any good treatment psychoed should always contain two elements. Number one, why the patient is feeling this way, and more importantly, why their symptoms aren't going away on their own. This is where the ABC model and vicious cycle come in. Number two, how are we going to support the patient to break this cycle? In essence, this is your rationale for how treatment will work. So let's start with that first bit, why the patient is feeling this way. At assessment, you should have given the patient an overview of CBT and the ABC model, but it's worth briefly going back over this now, as it may have been a number of weeks or even months since the patient's assessment. I won't go into a generic introduction to CBT today, as this would be the same across all interventions, but this should lead into a discussion of the ABC model. Within this discussion, you need to support the patient in understanding which of their symptoms go into which part of the model, and also how these areas are linked together. And you can see that a patient is doing this now. It is more collaborative to elicit these core symptoms from the patient, rather than telling them what was said at assessment, and make sure you allow the patient to explore which area of the model each symptom should fit into. Once the patient is happy with the ABC model, it's now time to discuss the vicious cycle, which is what CBT believes is keeping their symptoms going. In this case, we're going to look at the cycle of reduced activity, which underlies the behavior activation treatment. If you remember what I said before about good psychoed containing two parts, this is the first part, where the patient is starting to understand how their symptoms are linked together and why they're not going away on their own. In this case, we would explore with the patient how these symptoms are linked whilst using questions to aid the guided discovery approach. Remember, we should be supporting patients, not lecturing them. As an example, I might ask a patient, on this diagram, you can see that a lack of motivation and doing less are linked together. Why do you think this is? By the end of the discussion, the patient needs to understand that it is doing less, which is maintaining the vicious cycle. In other words, the reduction in activity is keeping their depression going. By doing less, the patient is not allowing themselves access to the kinds of positive experience that normally maintain and boost our mood. As an example, let's imagine we have two patients. Both patients wake up lacking motivation and experiencing negative thoughts about themselves. Now let's imagine that patient A forces themselves to get up and read a book they enjoy before doing a bit of cleaning and then chatting to a friend. Meanwhile, patient B lies in bed all day. Now this is a very black and white example, but hopefully most patients will be able to appreciate that the person who stayed in bed all day will feel worse. And so this is a good way of explaining the power of activity on our mood. Anyway, back to the model. So if you remember I said before that the second important part of psychoeducation is for the patient to understand how to break their vicious cycle. And this is the rationale for your intervention. Behavior activation is a behavioral intervention, as you may have guessed from the name. In this case, we're targeting the behavior of doing less. And as we know from the basis of CBT, once we break one area of the vicious cycle, the whole cycle starts to break down. In essence, the rationale for behavior activation is that by supporting the patient to do more, they will have more opportunity to engage with positive experiences like fun and achievement. And it is this that will improve their mood. So let's imagine that you've now completed your psychoeducation and rationale with the patient and they're happy with everything so far. The first step of the intervention is to consider what they're currently doing or perhaps more importantly, what they're currently not doing. 
This is a simple example of an activity diary I created, but you can easily find others online or in your service. The first task of behavior activation is for the patient to keep this diary for one to two weeks. The reason why the patient is doing this is because it gives you both a clear idea of how they're filling their time, which will be important in the next step of the treatment. At this stage, all the patient needs to do is write everything that they do over this period into the activity diary, giving detail on what they did, what time, who with, etc. Now, depending on the patient, you may stop here and they would complete their baseline diary as homework. However, you could also link this into the next step of behavior activation, which is identifying activities. As a side note, depending on what materials you're using, some researchers support the idea of using a baseline diary, whilst others jump straight to identifying activities. Both approaches are fine and would end up at the same point, but my personal opinion is that a baseline diary can help patients identify specifically what they're doing throughout the day. If I ask you now to think of everything you did yesterday, it's quite difficult, isn't it? By keeping a baseline diary, it can make the next step of treatment easier because the patient is really clear on both what they are and what they aren't currently doing. The next step of behavior activation is to classify activities into three categories, routine, necessary, and pleasurable. Routine activities are those that we tend to do regularly, often daily, and are normally a part of our day-to-day -day life. So this could include things like washing, brushing your teeth, and eating regularly. Necessary activities are important things that we need to do, and if we do not do these activities, there is usually a significant consequence. It is this consequence which differentiates necessary activities from routine activities. For example, if you skip a couple of days of brushing your teeth, it might not be that good for you, but there isn't going to be a significant consequence to that. However, if your car insurance needs renewing and you don't do it and subsequently get in an accident, there could be very severe consequences to this. Lastly, pleasurable activities are those that we enjoy doing. And depending on the individual, these could be absolutely anything from seeing friends to exercising to sitting at home with a book. When discussing the three types of activities, make sure you're asking questions to check understanding and stop it from feeling like a lecture. For instance, before defining what pleasurable activities are, you could ask, what do you think we mean by pleasurable activities? Remember to also elicit examples from the patient for each activity type. Once you're happy that the patient understands the three types of activities, you need to discuss how the patient is going to record these activities which is done using an RNP worksheet. As you can see, this worksheet gives the patient space to record a number of activities for each type. Normally, you would discuss a few examples in the session, and then the patient would complete this worksheet as homework. The patient would then spend the next week or two weeks recording as many activities as they can think of that either A, they used to do, but due to their depression, they're now doing less of or aren't doing at all, for example, eating regularly, seeing friends or paying bills, or B, new activities they want to do but don't have the motivation for, for example, picking up a new hobby. You might now be able to see why using a baseline diary can be helpful as it can support the patient in this step by clearly illustrating to them what they are and aren't doing day to day. Remember that all patients are different in terms of how quickly they will progress through this treatment. However, using our example, you can see that the patient came to our next treatment session having added more activities to their RNP worksheet. Once you have discussed this homework and you're happy that the patient is proficient in identifying activities, you can move on to the next step of behavior activation, which is to put these activities into a hierarchy. Within this step, the patient will rank the activities they came up with by difficulty. And when we're talking about difficulty, we mean how hard the patient would find it to do the activities due to their current mood and motivation. I think a nice way of explaining this to the patient is to say to them, if I asked you to do that task right now, how difficult do you think that would be for you? The reason we support the patient to create a hierarchy is simple. Behavior activation is based on the principle that doing more will improve our mood. By starting with the easiest activities, the patient will get what some people refer to as quick wins. The task may be small or relatively easy, and the benefit from this might be over quickly. However, these easy activities give patients the small boost to motivation and mood that can get the ball rolling for harder activities. I like to imagine motivation like a snowball. It starts small, but quickly builds up. In the same way that whilst a patient may not notice any change to their mood from simply brushing their teeth each morning, over time, the little sense of achievement they get from this will build up 
and give them the motivation to do more difficult tasks, which will then give them more motivation and so on. This is something that not a lot of people actually know about motivation. The more we do, the more motivation we have. You can probably imagine a day when you were super productive and got lots done, each task giving you more motivation and energy to plough on. On the other hand, we've all had lazy weekends where we haven't done much. Now, I'm in no way saying these are bad, but consider how by doing less you weren't recharging your motivation, which is a commonly held myth. You were likely less motivated on these lazy days. This supports the behaviour activation theory that it's by doing more that we increase our motivation. Another analogy that you can use for this process is that of a car with a flat battery. If you simply leave the car in the street or on your drive, the battery is never going to recharge itself. Instead, what you need to do is actively do something to get the car going, for example, by jump starting it. This is the same with our motivation. If we don't do anything about it, it won't recharge on its own. Anyway, back to the worksheet. So as I mentioned before, you're helping the patient to put their activities into this worksheet, rating them by difficulty. And as normal, you would get the patient to write some examples into the worksheet during the session. However, what happens if the patient cannot think of any activities to go in the easiest section? What if all of their activities fall into the hardest or medium sections? In this case, you can support the patient to break down some of their activities in order to create smaller, hopefully less difficult tasks. A nice example is cleaning the house. Someone may place cleaning the house in the hardest category as it will likely take a lot of time and energy to do. However, if you encourage the patient to break this down into smaller tasks, for example, cleaning upstairs and cleaning downstairs, each of those tasks may be easier. But imagine if cleaning upstairs is still in the medium difficulty section, where well, you can break it down again, and you may find that a smaller task, like cleaning their bedroom, may be in the easiest section. The patient would then complete this activity as homework. It's very important that before you move on to the next step of the intervention, the patient has completed and has a good knowledge of all previous tasks. So this includes the baseline diary, identifying routine necessary and pleasure activities, and ranking them on a difficulty hierarchy. Once the patient has a list of activities ranked by difficulty, you can start planning these activities in. But before you do this, it'd be a good idea here to recap the rationale for behaviour activation. And you can be collaborative by trying to elicit this from the patient. The reason why it's good to go over the rationale here is because this is the core of the intervention. This is the step where we actually start to get the patient doing more. And as we discussed earlier, we know that doing more builds motivation and opens the patient up to more positive experiences, which can improve mood. Before the patient starts doing more, we need to support them to plan these activities. And the way we do that is through using a BA diary, which you may notice is the same one we used as a baseline diary earlier in the intervention. My example here only has a couple of days, so I can show you more clearly on the screen. But imagine this went all the way from Monday to Sunday. Even though the patient has seen this diary before, they haven't used it to plan future activities, and so you need to discuss with them why this is important and how the diary works. Remember to ask questions before you jump in with your explanations. For example, asking, why do you think we plan activities before telling the patient why we do it? Hopefully your patient will have some idea, but the reason we get them to plan ahead of time is simple. Research shows us that if we plan to do something, we're more likely to do it, and even more so when the plan is highly specific. What this means is that by supporting patients to very specifically plan activities, they're more likely to do them and therefore receive the positive benefits of activity that we discussed previously. You may remember a time when you wanted to do something, but did you ever do it? If not, it may be because you didn't specifically plan it. For instance, you may be in a situation where a friend or family member has said to you, we should meet up soon. But what invariably happens is soon never comes because it falls away to the other demands of life. However, if instead of saying we should meet up soon, you agreed with that person to have coffee on Tuesday at 10 a.m. at Cafe Nero, you would certainly be more likely to see them. This works the same with all types of activity, and that's why you need to get the importance of planning across to your patients. And you can elicit examples from them to keep this collaborative. For instance, if a patient puts revise for a French exam on their hierarchy, you could ask them, do you think it's more likely that you'll revise if you say, I want to do some revision this week, or if you plan to revise at 9pm on Monday for one hour? Now that the patient understands the benefit of planning activities, we need to think about the type of activities that they plan. And for this, there are two key things for the patient to consider. 
the difficulty of activities and the balance of activities. When thinking about the difficulty of tasks, the patient should refer back to the hierarchy they made earlier. Remember what we said before about quick wins? Well, this is where it comes into play. To start with, the patient chooses activities solely from the easiest end of their hierarchy. And remember how we can break activities down if the patient doesn't have many there. The only exception to this would be if there was a necessary activity that needed to be completed imminently. Then you would try to support the patient with this, even if it wasn't in the easiest part of the hierarchy. However, again, consider how you could break this task down. Next, the patient needs to consider having a balance of activities. And the reason for this is, again, relatively simple. We need all three in our lives. For instance, you may do all the routine tasks in the world, eating well, cleaning every day, on top of your personal hygiene. But if you never do anything you enjoy, what do you think your mood would be like? Similarly, you could spend all day doing pleasurable tasks, having the most fun ever. But if you neglect the necessary tasks, it could mean you lose your house because you didn't pay the mortgage. You can use the three-legged stool analogy here to support the patient's understanding. If you imagine a three-legged stool, all of the legs need to be the same length in order for it to be stable. If one leg is shorter than the others, the stool will topple over. This is the same for activity. We need all three types in our lives. So to recap, when planning activities, the patient needs to have a balance of activities and they need to start with the easiest end of the hierarchy, gradually moving up when they feel able. Once you have discussed this, it'd be a good idea to get the patient to work through some examples within the session, planning activity for the following week. It really depends on the patient. However, a good place to start might be to plan in one activity from each of the three groups to do over the first week. So for example, if we look at this hierarchy, we see that the patient is eating breakfast, playing guitar, paying electricity bill, showering every day, going for a drive and playing tennis in the easiest section of the hierarchy. If the patient has understood what we discussed earlier, then they should pick three activities from this easiest list, one routine, one necessary and one pleasurable. When planning, you should discuss the four W's with the patient, which will help them specifically plan what they're going to do. When are they going to do the activity? So what time? What is the activity they're going to be doing? And remember to be as specific as possible. Where are they doing the activity? Is it at home or elsewhere? And finally, who are they doing the activity with? Here you can see examples of two activities that the patient has planned to do next week. He's going to pay his electricity bill, which is a necessary activity, at 9am on Monday morning. And you can see that he's also identified where he will do that and who with. You can also see that the patient has planned a pleasure activity, playing tennis for 6 p.m. on Tuesday, and this is taking place with his friend Tom at Colchester Leisure Centre. I haven't included it within the example, as this only covers Monday and Tuesday, but assuming that this patient's first week of conducting BA activities, you would likely plan a routine activity later in the week. The last thing to discuss with a patient is that no matter how unmotivated they feel, they need to try their hardest to do the planned task. This is called sticking to the plan, not the mood. Even if the patient is having a bad day, they should try and push themselves to follow the plan because for BA to work, they need to be engaging in regular activity. They'll start to feel better in the long term. They just need to force themselves over this first hurdle. It can be good to normalise here how it can be difficult to motivate yourself at first. However, over time, this will get easier. And you can think back to the snowball analogy that we discussed earlier. So now your patient has planned in their activities. They'll spend the next week or fortnight following this plan. And at this point, all we can do is wait until your next appointment. From this point onwards, all of your appointments will be focused on reviewing the patient's progress with their activities over the last week or two weeks. Primarily, what you're doing is checking that they did the activities. And in this example, you can see that the patient was able to pay the electricity bill, but did not play tennis. Depending on whether the activity was completed or not will depend on how you respond to this. If the patient has completed the task, as they did with paying the bill, you would ask them how they felt the task went, what it felt like doing the task, how they felt afterwards, how they'd feel about doing the task again, etc. Remember to also give lots of positive reinforcement here, as even the smallest of tasks can be a cause for great celebration if your patient is depressed and lacking motivation. If the patient has not completed the activity, then it's important that you work out why this was. Was it due to external barriers, in which case you could consider Com B? Was it due to a lack of motivation, in which case the patient may not fully understood follow the plan, not the mood? 
or they may have not understood how the intervention works. In either case, you could recap the rationale for what you're doing and remember to do this collaboratively, for example, by asking the patient what they remember from the previous session. Alternatively, it may be that the activity you planned together was just too hard and actually you need to break this down further in order for the patient to complete it. Following this discussion, you'd refer back to the hierarchy and consider whether planning in more activities is appropriate. Remember that you're gradually moving up the hierarchy, so you wouldn't be jumping up to the hardest activities within the first week. Also, consider that there's no exact science to how many activities the patient should have in their diary or how often you add in new activities. This completely depends on the patient. For someone who's really engaging and has a good grasp on the intervention, you may plan another three activities for the following week, and that will be on top of any activities they want to keep going from the previous week. However, for someone who hasn't completed all of the previous week's activities, like the example here, we may only plan one new activity or could even simply stay with the current activities until the patient is happy doing all of them. And this is the format that the rest of your behaviour activation sessions would follow. Review the diary, discuss the previously planned activities, troubleshoot any issues and then plan new activities as appropriate. We have now covered the full behaviour activation intervention. But before we finish, there's an important concept that you and your patients need to understand, boom and bust. If your patient is having a good day, they may think it's a good idea to do as much as they can as quickly as they can. This is referred to as an activity boom. The problem is that this can lead to a bust where the sudden increase in activity leads to the patient feeling even more lethargic and worn out than normal in following days, which then impacts their subsequent activity. What we know is that consistent activity is better for us than boom and bust. This is because behaviour activation is based on the concept that regular activity is required to boost our mood. If the patient is so worn out from their boom day that they cannot do anything the following days, then they're not getting this boost consistently throughout the week. If you imagine, you go to the cinema, see friends, go out for dinner and go for a run all in one day. You'll likely feel great at the end of that day, However, this positive mood is unlikely to maintain if you then spend the rest of the week in bed withdrawing from the world due to lethargy. Instead, if the patient was to spread these four activities throughout the week, their mood would be consistently boosted following these activities. As well as doing lots, patients may want to prematurely jump up their hierarchy if they're having a good day. So it is important that you reiterate that this is a graded process. Consider a marathon runner who recently recovered from a broken leg. They would not jump straight back to running marathons. They would gradually increase their activity, for instance, increasing from a 1K run to 5K to 10K and so on. This is the same for our patients. They should try to gradually increase their activity rather than pushing themselves to the max and then burning out. We've now covered the full behavior activation intervention, but before we finish, let's summarize the key steps that we've discussed today. Step one is psychoeducation. Introduce the patient to depression and cognitive behavioural therapy, then transition into looking at how the ABC model explains their symptoms. Step two is the vicious cycle. Here we're solidifying the idea that the patient's symptoms are linked together and we're looking at what is specifically keeping their symptoms going. This then links into the rationale for the intervention. So in this case, we'd look at the cycle of reduced activity before supporting the patient to understand how behaviour activation can break this cycle. Step three is to support the patient to complete a baseline diary to identify what activities they are and aren't currently doing. Step four is to identify routine, necessary and pleasurable activities that the patient is not currently doing. Step five is to put these activities into a hierarchy, ranking them by how difficult the patient would find doing them, remembering to support the patient to break down activities to make them easier as required. Step six is then to take a range of activities from the easiest end of the patient's hierarchy, balance between the three activity types and plan them into the patient's BA diary. Remember to be as specific as possible when planning these activities in. Step seven is for the patient to then do these planned activities outside your sessions. And lastly, step eight is to review progress. How did the patient do with the planned activities? If they did them, what benefit did they see? If they didn't do them, how come? troubleshoot any issues. Then for the rest of your sessions, you'll support the patient to repeat the process of planning activities, doing the activities, then reviewing how they went. You'll end your last session with some form of relapse prevention, but that's for another video.
I hope this video has helped develop your knowledge of the behaviour activation intervention and will assist you in treating patients with depression in your clinical practice. If you're interested in other videos like this, then you should watch the rest of this video series, focusing on cognitive restructuring, worry management, exposure therapy and more. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a nice rest of your day.